Renegade University is growing faster than ever. We now have three upcoming webinars for you to consider. The most recently announced is The Case Against Morality, which will be taught by the great philosophy professor Stephen Kirshner. I can't wait for this one. It is going to blow a lot of minds. That begins May 17th. However, there's an early bird sale for that one. So if you get your ticket before or by April 26th, it's only one credit. After that, it's two credits. So go to renegadeuniversity.com. You'll see it by scrolling down on the front page or by clicking on video courses. That's the case against morality with Stephen Kirshner. On May 5th, I will begin my two-part series on Plato's Republic, which is part of our great book series, which will be unrolling over the next year, year and a half. Again, that starts May 5th. That's Plato's Republic with me. It's been selling really well, but we do have some seats left. Now, the best-selling webinar to date, Renegade University History, is an introduction to cryptocurrency with Vin Armani, but there are a few seats left. So go to renegadeuniversity.com again. Click on video courses or scroll down on the front page and you'll see all these courses. You've got The Case Against Morality with Stephen Kirshner, Plato's Republic with me, and An Introduction to Cryptocurrency with Vin Armani. RenegadeUniversity.com. I'll see you in class. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. Four days after this interview took place, my guest's YouTube channel was deleted. Over 14 years, he had posted more than 1,700 videos, which were viewed more than 90 million times, and had built a massive audience on YouTube, which included more than 569,000 subscribers. I want you to watch this interview and decide what this means. What it means for my guest, obviously, but also what it means for unregistered what it means for other new media outlets, what it means for free speech, and what it means for those of us who dissent from the dominant narratives of the day. This is my interview with James Corbett. I am joined from Western Japan uh, by the great James Corbett of The Corbett Report, well known to many listeners of this podcast, I know, because many of them have told me about you. And I was unaware of your work until a few months ago. And one of my good friends said, you've got to get this guy on your show. you got to get this guy on your show. And I finally got around to watching your stuff and reading your stuff. And, you know, people, the short take on you is that you're a conspiracy theorist. And my short take on you is that you're a conspiracy theorist. Now, here's the thing, James. Guess who else is a conspiracy theorist? right here, me, because you and I agree on something very fundamental, which I think is really the basis of your work, um, which is that the biggest and most important conspiracies are all open, right? And, yeah. you call, and you call your work open source intelligence news, right? Now, can you explain that? I think I know what it means, but I would love for you to give a full explanation of what that means. Because I think, I think it's actually like the most important thing to explain about your work. Yeah. I agree. And that's why it is the tagline of my website. And it has been since it was uh, founded in 2007. So when I was first coming up with the idea of starting a website um, in late 2006, early 2007, 
it was at that time that I was encountering some information. Um, and I believe there was a specifically a Washington Post article that I, I read at that time that I actually included in the about section on my website way back in the day. It's not there anymore. But it was specifically about the concept of open source intelligence and the fact that the CIA and other intelligence agencies gather the vast majority of their information from open sources, not the James Bond sleuthing Hollywood version of intelligence gathering, but by looking at open sources. And back in the day, of course, that was radio, television, newspaper, magazine, kind of print and, and broadcast material. But mm -hmm. in the online age, it's online material. And in fact, probably even more so in the online age than back in the day when they were intercepting Russian radio transmissions or what have you. No, now, mm -hmm. now you can go online and you can access an incredible amount of information. And I thought, why not apply that in an, in an open source investigation that we can all crowdsource information and put it together and lay out the dots. And rather than sitting there on some sort of high horse and saying, please believe me about this. No, we're, we're in the internet age. I can link you to source documents that, uh, that, that I think back up what I'm saying, but you can go and look for yourself. And that is the very founding ethos and principle that my work is based upon. It was there from the very inception. The first thing I thought when I was thinking about putting together a podcast was I'm going to have a documentation list. And every time I talk about a document, an article, a video, whatever, I'm going mm -hmm. to link people to it because why not? Mm -hmm. We're in the internet age. It shouldn't have been a revolutionary idea, but back in 2007, when I started the site, there were still profoundly few people who were doing that. So uh, if, if, if my work does nothing else, I hope inc inculcating that idea in its uh, in the audience that it is important for people to actually back up what they're saying with sources should be just the basic ground level of the work that I'm doing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's even bigger and better than that, though. Your evidence is so compelling and persuasive because most of, I think, the most important evidence you deploy is simply elite people saying what you say they're saying <laughs> it's you have you know i mean or or have them saying the opposite of what they're saying but you have them saying the thing on camera or in writing with their name on top of it you know i mean a lot of, like you did this whole analysis of joe biden's ghost written recent article in the foreign affairs right uh well that's foreign affairs journal it's the cfr council on foreign relations journal everyone knows about it that i mean that's your whole episode was devoted to just an analysis of that very very open document but Am I right that like the best evidence that you have, the most persuasive and compelling, the stuff that you really hang your arguments on is actually the elites saying things directly in a public forum, right? It 100% correct. And in fact, I wear as a badge of honor, one of the best pieces of criticism that I ever saw leveled against my mm. work was on my Century of Enslavement, a History of the Federal Reserve documentary. Um, someone I uh, remarked uh, at one point, but this is basically just, you know, Federal Reserve material and Federal Reserve documents that you're talking <laughs> right. about. I'm like, yes, exactly. yes, it is. Exactly. Right. That's exactly right. Isn't it amazing that, and maybe this kind of like just pulls the rug out from under both of us and all of our life's work, <laughs> but isn't it amazing that the CIA and the federal government in the United States allows things to be declassified after 50 or so years and that we just find out the most outlandish things the CIA actually did, you know, that's that the, the government's saying, yeah, 50 years ago, yeah, we did try to overthrow this government or 60 years ago, we, we tried to assassinate this foreign leader democratically elected or yada, 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 go on and on and on. But isn't that sort of remarkable? I mean, obviously, you know, when you studied the, when I studied the Soviet Union back in the day, it was called Kremlinology because you just there just weren't any sources because it was all behind closed doors. And a lot of what China people are doing these days have the similar problem. Right. It's uh, they just you just don't know what the Communist Chinese Party is, is saying and they don't announce it. Unlike Americans, Americans eventually announce meaning meaning American sort of government officials eventually seem to announce most of what we need to know. And it's utterly damning. And yet there it sits. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and in a sense, that is the most insidious form of information control, okay. because then they can come out and say, look, there are no hidden secrets. Look, we told you all about that thing that happened 50 years ago. It's not happening now. Trust well, us. See, right. you can trust us because we told you about those bad things that happened 50 years ago. And then 50 years from now, you find out what they were doing today. And 50 years from then, you find out, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it is an exceptionally effective way of uh, containing the, the box of, of oh. criticism. So here is allowable criticism about the things that we've done in the past, but we've learned our lesson and we're moving forward. And that, that again, I mean, it's, you could not come up with a more uh, thoroughgoing control of the information paradigm than what has been constructed 
uh, specifically in the free and open and democratic Western nations mm -hmm. that, are, that are transparent and uh, they value human rights and all of this rhetoric. And they will live up to the rhetoric to the exact point at which it starts to interfere with current agenda items, in which case then, of course, it goes out the window. But uh, yes, being able to point to all of that stuff that you can criticize about the past is a way of, in a sense, giving them carte blanche for what they're doing at the moment. Do you, to me, the problem, I guess, is that I, this is speculative, but I mean, I got I have to think that the problem at the base of all of this is that Americans, generally speaking, have been actually uninterested in politics. It's weird to say that now, but it's actually true. And, and even now, when they seem to be hyper interested in politics, they're actually not right. Of course, most of them have a very superficial understanding of politics based on the particular cable news network they watch. But I have to think that this sort of and I don't know if it's deliberate, but this way of couching everything in ways that make it seem legitimate, like we're going to we're going to release the documents in a certain number of years that depends upon not just an ignorant, but an apathetic public. Right. I mean, if 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 I would think I would like to think that in other countries, if they disclosed this previously classified information about assassinations and coups and yada, yada, that there would be a different reaction or what do you think well you would like to think so but look yeah. for example at the declassification about operation gladio or at least the bits of it that have been declassified it did cause a ruckus at the time in the early 90s when it was first coming out in italian parliament now which and operation which operation is this operation gladio so this was the stay behind operation um that nato is formerly was in charge of but that definitely had ties into the u.s uh, intelligence apparatus and that was uh, essentially, the cover was well. The commies may come in and invade Europe, so we have to make sure that these are there's these secret paramilitary organizations that are that will be armed and equipped and able to do sabotage work when the commies come in and invade Europe. Um, but of course, all they ultimately ended up doing was committing terror attacks and then blaming them on the commies uh, in order to essentially rule uh, through through fear. Um, the 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 years of lead and all of that in Italy, as it turns out, oh, it was all this NATO stay behind operation operation that went rogue or whatever that that started to come out in the early 90s um, through Italian parliament parliamentary investigations and started to cause a ruckus there were even I mean mainstream BBC documentaries and things that have been made about this but the investigation went so far and then does the public even know the name Gladio at this point? Maybe, maybe uh, no. not. And do they know that, in fact, Gladio was just the name of the Italian version of that operation and there were different branches in different countries? I mean, it starts to get more and more complex and most people just lose the plot at that point. So here I am, a historian of American foreign relations. I don't really know about it. <laughs> Thank you again. I mean, and I've learned so much from from the, the work I've read. Tell tell us again. So is this this is from the 40s? You're talking about the founding of NATO or Right. Yeah. yeah it yeah, it yeah. started in the 40s. In fact, I believe it was part of a British military operation that okay. was going on um, before that point. But uh, in World War II, essentially, they were planning um, for this already. But um, in the late 1940s, it started to be formalized and operationalized under NATO as it was coming together. Um, but there were U.S. Uh, military and intelligence personnel that were essentially um, running it at that time. Uh, okay. And then it, it got spun off through through NATO and um, it continued up through the 50s, 60s, 70s. Mm. And uh, by the time it got uh, exposed in, in Italian parliament in the 90s, they said, don't worry, guys, you know, we're stopping and we're not doing any of that anymore. But again, the investigations went so far and then no further. And uh, not a lot has been uh, dug up in recent years on this because uh, that's 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 ancient past. That's 50 years ago. OK, so you're saying that this operation came to light in the early or mid 1990s um, that NATO was formed with this false pretext. Now, not only a false pretext, but that the CIA was actively doing things to instigate basically to create reasons to for NATO's existence, to justify its existence. Right. And, and well, so I, I don't I don't know. I wouldn't say that this operation was specifically the, the the reason for the founding of NATO, but it was it was certainly put under the NATO umbrella. And it, but it kept it, it helped kept keep it going, right? It, pr it provided a pretext for its existence. And it so. certainly provided cover for yeah. why there was this military coordination between these various nations and why they had such secrecy, such that Italian parliament and the parliaments of the various European countries didn't even know this existed. The mm -hmm. prime minister could literally say, I had no idea this, this existed. Mm -hmm. Oh, but there's this secret paramilitary organization that's been operating here for decades. 
And so I was just struck by how that came to light in the 90s at exactly the time when there was a debate going on about NATO, which was whether it should continue to exist because it was created for the Soviet Union, which no longer exists in the 1990s. So it's remarkable that this thing comes to light about the founding, basically, of the damn thing at the time we're debating it when there is no apparent reason for its existence. And yet what happened? NATO then ends up going all the way to the western border of Russia. My goodness, what, what an accomplishment. And that requires, again, profound apathy and ignorance on the part of the people who elect people like Bill Clinton. I mean, and and George Bush and Barack Obama and <laughs> Donald Trump. Yes, uh, absolutely. But uh, and, and this is where you start to get into the the space where I don't I don't want to blame victims for their victimization. And I think the public has been the targeted mm. uh, victims of a concerted effort to keep them in a state of distraction and apathy. Now, clearly, there is personal responsibility at play here. But at at the same time, I don't know if any human population has ever been subjected to such a coordinated attempt to keep them politically apathetic and then to pull the rug out at, under them at any point at which they actually start to become politically motivated. Once again, let's point to an actual source from an actual person talking about this big new Brzezinski, who people mm. might know as Carter's national security advisor, someone who's been hanging around administration after administration mm -hmm. until his death a few years ago. Um, back about a decade ago, he was on a little speaking tour um, and I believe it was at the Montreal version of what was a Council on Foreign Relations equivalent in Canada. Um, I, I could stand to be corrected, but there's audio of him talking about this where formerly it used to be easier to uh, control a million people than to kill a million people. But hmm. because of the activation, the political activation, the rising political consciousness that we are seeing in the Internet era, that calculus may have changed and it may be easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. Dot, dot, dot. Fill in the blanks for yourself. What does that mean coming from someone like Zbigniew Brzezinski? At any rate, I, I think they are aware that this there is a profound shift that has been happening over the course of the past couple of decades because of the incredible access to information, open source information in the Internet revolution. And that's precisely why we are seeing the headlong rush towards censorship right now. Wow. OK, so I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to I'm going to invoke Michel, Michel Foucault. Um, <laughs> pardon me, but he does have one of his major theories is that in the pre-modern age, governments basically controlled people through force, through killing them, you know, or threatening to kill them, right? And that in the modern age that shifted and the, the attention began to be paid to our consciousness and controlling people through, through what, you, what you talk about, right? Through discourse, which enters the head and then becomes internalized and the rules and the norms of the power elite become internalized and then we, then spread that power through by talking to other people and surveilling them and judging them, right? Becoming cops. So it's, it's remarkable that you said that. That sounds very much like uh, Foucault's theory. But yeah, so you are, are you actually saying, and he said that, he said that in the old, in the pre-modern age, kings and slave masters just found it actually very difficult to control large numbers of people through threatening to kill them or actually killing them. But it, they turned out to be much more effective form of control to get them to believe that they are doing something bad, right? Exactly right. So um, this, I think, probably goes back to the distinction that Neil Postman pointed out between the Orwellian versus the Huxleyan version of control of society, the boot in the face versus yeah. um, keeping people placated with Soma. I huh. think that does a disservice to Orwell, who I think more profoundly <laughs> understood the psychological nature of what that what was really happening with the control grid than uh, that might imply. But I, I, I do see that distinction at play. And, and I think there is something to that, that clearly there is more of the kind of Soma keeping the, the population distracted and amusing ourselves to death, as it were. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 so I, I am profoundly in accord with what you're saying. And I'll point this to a recent editorial that I wrote about how to save the world in one easy step. I'm talking about that the most dangerous weapon that has ever been invented and ever will be invented in the history of humanity by far is not the atom bomb or the neutron bomb or any sort of space ray weaponry technology. It is narrative. Yeah. Narrative <laughs> is the yeah. weapon that can be deployed on the human population to get, at this point, over half of the human population to mostly willingly lock themselves inside their own homes, mask up six feet apart, all of this, 
because they have been given a narrative that lets, leads them to believe that this is the right thing to do. And that power is the ultimate power. And unfortunately, it is being wielded at this point almost exclusively by people who want to control and suppress the human population rather than those who free it. But that's why saving the world in one easy step, come up with a narrative that will infect the minds of the population in a, in a different way to free them as it were, rather than to enslave them. And uh, easier said than done. But at any rate, I think that's, a, that's what it comes down to. It is narrative. Yeah. So you're also a historian. You've done a lot of pieces on history. You've done a lot of research on history. Um, do you think that we are less free now than, say, 100 years ago? It's a difficult question because, of course, it's in relation to what. Yeah. And um, I am not one of those people who would just easily say, if you could go back you know, a thousand years ago, would you? Well, no, I'm sure <laughs> that my great, 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 great grandparents were scrabbling to eke out a meager existence from the earth. And it was right. a terrible and horrible existence, I am sure, because I am certainly not a part of any elite family that enjoyed any mm. elite privileges. I'm from coal mining stock from Newcastle. Oh, me too. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty man. sure I would have been down in the coal mines from an early age and probably died yeah. terribly early if I'd been born at that point. So yeah, I mean, there is something to be said. I'm, I, I don't take it lightly, the type of existence that we, that we lead now and the incredible luxury of what we lead, but it obviously comes with the chains, the mm -hmm. chains of convenience. And those chains ultimately strip away at our humanity. Yeah. What makes us human is systematically being drummed out of the population. And that to me is, that, that's the game for all the marbles. I have always thought that regardless of what kind of tyranny erects itself and tries to impose its will, Orwellian or Huxleyan, on the human population, there is at the very least, there is a spark of humanity that will always rise up and will always overthrow the dictators at some point, no matter mm. how bleak it gets, mm. humanity will rise up until there's no more humanity, which sounds ridiculous until you start thinking about the, for example, gene editing technologies and okay. other things that are truly making the end of the human species a real viable possibility. Uh, that is profoundly chilling to me because at some point it presumably will be possible for people in positions of power to actually engineer a compliant, subservient, not human, but quasi-human species of essentially a slave class. And, and uh, Eloy and Morlocks, if you want to put it in science fiction terms, or if you want to put it in more real world terms, you go back to uh, um, Aldous Huxley, yeah. uh, Brave New World author, obviously, talking yeah. in the 1950s and 60s about the ultimate revolution and talking about the, the experiments and other things he had seen going on about implanting electrodes in the brain to essentially placate people and make them happy when they are not. And he talked about the incredible power that scientific dictators of the future would happen, would have in order to keep populations quiet. Or mm. Bertrand Russell writing about the very same sorts of things, the impact of science on society. Mm. This has been talked about for at least half a century now. And that was half a century old technology or 60, 70 year old technology at this point. Can you imagine how much further advanced that technology is today? Well, you're making global gov government leaders sound like monsters. <laughs> okay. Now, oh. Um, uh, sorry. Oh, I didn't mean to well, cast aspersions on our wise leaders. <laughs> you know, I'm no fan either. Um, and I think there's something absolutely inexplicable about someone who would want to wield power over millions of other people. I just don't understand that impulse. Most, I, I don't think I've ever known anybody who has that impulse, right? I mean, it's just a very strange thing to want to manage well, society. Or do you think that? Well, uh, so I, I tend to locate this in psychopathy. Um, okay. And so I think we have to have an understanding that there are people with a truly different uh, neurology. Their, their brains do not function like yours yeah. or, or mine does, yeah. and that they truly do not feel compa compassion, empathy, etc. And this is a documented scientific phenomenon. People can look into psychopathy to understand how that works. And um, I, there's... There's obviously, there's a lot of debate about these terms and how they're employed, but psychopathy being the actual neurological condition and sociopathy being essentially learned 
psychopathy, um, mm -hmm. people being conditioned into a state of psych psychopathy um, or, or emulating the psychopaths in order to uh, achieve power in, in society. And you can look at the work of uh, Philip Zimbardo and others on the Lucifer effect, for example. Um, how do these sort of average, you know, farm boys from the middle of Iowa go out to um, um, uh, Abu Ghraib and, and start t torturing right. people? Is it because these are born natural torturing psychopathic people or because they were inculcated into a system which uh, essentially allowed that to take place um, and does that absolve their personal responsibility etc cetera, etc cetera. there are a lot of issues there but i think there is something to the creation of institutional frameworks that actually inculcate a type of behavior that is anti-human in a lot of mm -hmm. respects and that i think that does have to come from people who are fundamentally psycho psychopathic but it doesn't have to be forwarded or or um, made possible only by psychopaths. I think that they they have cadres of people who are willing to essentially adopt those types of traits. But on a more fundamental level, if you want to look again at narrative, I think there is narrative in so far as, of course, as something that you and, and myself and everyone I think can relate to. We all want to think of ourselves as the heroes doing the good thing for humanity, et cetera, et cetera. So how can people who are doing what seem to be profoundly horrible things think of themselves as the good people? Well, they need a narrative for that. And so there has always been a narrative that is essentially a justification for the ruling class. Why do the ruling class exist and why do they have the right to rule over other people? And that narrative has evolved over time back thousands of years ago, literally your rulers were gods. The pharaohs were gods on earth and you literally worship them uh, directly. And as the population started sort of cottoned onto that trick and well, maybe these people aren't actual gods. Mm -hmm. uh, it started to get toned down a little. Well, okay, they're not gods. Th their family was chosen by God to rule over you. It's the divine right of kings, right? Mm -hmm. It's the mandate of heaven. Um, but again, after the Enlightenment and Scientific Revolution and all this, well, that seems a bit hokey. Okay, we can't go with that anymore. No, there's a special thing, the protoplasm that our family has that is passed down from generation to generation. It wasn't, of course, until many decades after this first got forwarded that they started to even understand genes and things like this. But essentially, there's a genetic reason why we deserve to rule over you, oh, you okay. minions. And, uh, and so we will put you in your place. And that, uh, that eugenics philosophy, which was developed formally in the late 19th century by Francis Galton, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's difficult for people in our situation today to understand just how important that science was in the late 19th, early 20th century. The rock star super science of its time, the way climate change is today, yep. was eugenics right. in the early 20th century. And anyone who was anyone espoused their good eugenical beliefs. Of course, we need to improve the the, the genetic stock, the protoplasm of the, the species and get rid of these vile underclass that keep breeding and keep making more of themselves. That was the profound problem of society. and. Unfortunately, the Nazis came along and made that seem a bit icky with all of their, you know, killing people and euthanasia and all that. Uh, okay, all right, we'll have to change it. So it went underground. It became population control. Literally, the American Eugenic Society set up as the Population Council under J JDR, John D. D. Rockefeller III. Oh, there's been a lot of anxiety over the last year because of the lockdowns. I've certainly been a victim of that, but there's a new form of anxiety. This is unheard of. But it's real. It's the anxiety of people who want the lockdowns to continue forever and can't have that anymore. We're about to be in a free society and freedom scares a lot of people. You may have met some of these people. They're the ones who wear masks when they're all alone in a car. Here's what I have to say to them. I have felt that kind of anxiety, not about that issue, but I have felt that kind of anxiety. And what I love to do is take some CBD products, especially from Paloma Verde CBD. If you go to palomaverdestore.com and use the discount code RENEGADE, you get 25% off of all of their anxiety-reducing, insomnia-reducing medication known as CBD. It comes in many different products. My three favorite products at Paloma Verde have been bundled into what's called the Unregistered Combo Pack, also known as the Thad Pack. I use these products every day to deal with my anxiety and my insomnia, although I have to say I am feeling a little bit better now that the lockdowns are being lifted. But that includes their delicious fruit flavored gummies, 10 milligrams per gummy. I love these things. 
their soft gels, that's 25 milligrams per soft gel. That's the serious medication. I take two to six of these per day. And then their fast acting, high potency tincture. Put some drops under your tongue and almost right away, you'll feel the bad feelings fade away. So go to Paloma Verde store. Dot com. Use the discount code Renegade. You get 25% off every single product. You get another 10% off if you use the if you join their mailing list. And the unregistered combo pack, the fad pack that I just showed you, that's 33% off. So go to PalomaVerdeStore.com. Use the discount code Renegade. Make your body feel better and make your life better. And God, I thank you. The same people who were founding the Eugenic Society and funding it were founding and funding the Population Council. It got moved into the World Wildlife Federation, which sounds beautiful until you see the literal eugenicists who, who founded that, including Julian Huxley, Aldous Huxley's brother, who was mm -hmm. also a literal card-carrying eugenicist, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera. A continuity of agenda up until the 21st century, at which point then perhaps that is going to merge with this new technocratic idea which of course is that the technocratic state is going to be the justification for a ruling class. There is a scientific priestly class that deserves to rule over you because they more profoundly understand how the world works. And they will tell you how that world works. Listen to the experts because science says, and that is going to be the new ruling uh, ideology for the 21st century. And we know where this is taking us and we can see it happening right now in the COVID-1984 world that we're sleepwalking into. That was brilliant and completely correct from my point of view. And I want to, and I want to do it again, though. I want to make sure people get this, um, the connections between eugenics and you didn't mention it, progressivism, mm -hmm. but I know you, I know, you know, the connection and then the really big move you make, which I think it's you, me, and about two other authors have done this is to connect, but you've done it the best, eugenics to post-World War, because people generally think, oh, that's this old thing that we used to do to people, awful, terrible, and we're so ashamed of it, but after World War II, it disappeared. No, it re-emerged as in ways you totally described, but let's go back to the original thing. So eugenics, turn of the 20th century, becomes, yes, you are totally right, and this is not even controversial, okay? Any historian will tell you that it was the sexiest science out there, that it was being taught at Harvard, Yale, Berkeley, Stanford, everywhere, that the New York Times believed in it, the presidents believed in it, senators, lawmakers believed in it, and of course it ended up in various pieces of legislation, and especially the 1924 Immigration Act, which barred white people from the United States because they were considered to be uh, genetically inferior. So the way that, you may have noticed this, the way that progressives now talk about eugenics is to generally blame it on people like, you know, Southern racists and conservatives and Republicans and because <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. It was overwhelmingly a progressives project. Now, is that just a mistake on, is it just an ab aberrant? Was it a mistake? Because that's also how, once they're confronted with the evidence about how many progressives supported eugenics and actually did the eugenics research and funded the eugenics research, how do you think eugenics fits into the progressive ideology generally? Because progressives now, when asked, would tell you that it has nothing to do with progressivism. It was just this unfortunate sort of addition to it in the early 20th century. It was a mistake that was corrected and we got rid of it. And now progressives are nice people like Barack Obama who don't believe in eugenics, you mean conspiracy theorist. So what do you think? What is the connection between eugenics and progressivism? So there is a profound co co connection there. You might almost say it's genetic in the uh, progressive uh, <laughs> it genome. Is, um, uh, but it is it, it is a profound connection. And the, the best articulation and documentation of that connection that I have ever seen was by Murray Rothbard in hmm. The Progressive Era. Mm -hmm. And I would really suggest people read that that bit of history if they haven't yet, because hmm. he really digs into the, the biographies of a lot of these people, the Richard T. Ely's and others, and looks at yep. their their backgrounds, which were generally speaking um, ecumenical. A lot of these people were uh, devout believers, uh, Protestants uh, from families of of, of preachers, etc., mm -hmm. um, who were going into the seminary or actually had attended seminary and things like this. Who 
became converted essentially to the progressive ideology or really founded the progressive ideology there in the late 19th century and propagated it into the early 20th century um, and essentially swapped out the, the sort of eschatology of the, the, the Protestant Bible believer in, for the eschatology of we're going to perfect, perfect humanity yep. through the state. And that was ultimately what uh, became the new God of this religion. And part of that, it was mixed in with this idea of improving the species through eugenics, because let's not, I mean, don't give eugenics a bad name. Dysgenics is that icky, you know, involuntary sterilization or killing people or that kind of thing. No, no, no. Eugenics is about good genes, propagating the good genes into the future by making sure that the, the healthy families breed. And who are the healthy families? What does it mean to be well, well, a fit person and, and well adjusted? And who gets to decide that? Oh, of course people who are in positions of power. So of course, I mean, from its very inception, this was always an upper class elite ideology created by uh, respectable gentleman scientists in late 19th century England. And uh, of course, adopted by uh, upper class and, and well, well to do people uh, around the world, because of course, well, yes, this is why we are successful is because we are, we just have the genes for it. So we, we clearly know what to do and we know how to tell people. And this also provided a convenient justification for the robber barons that are arised in the 19th century, the nouveau riche of that time. I mean, mm -hmm. where, how do they, how do they justify becoming part of the power class? How, how can they wield power? They're not part of these families that were chosen by God or anything. No, it's because our genes helped us rise to the, be the cream of the crop. So now clearly we deserve to be here. Uh, it's such a convenient ideology in so many different ways. And I think it meshes very well with the progressive ideology, which as I say, was about the perfecting of humanity through the state. It was going to be the state that was going to essentially guide people into this. And part of that would have to be the state would tell you, you know, oh, oh you're not fit to breed or whatever the case may be. And that, that was an important part of it. I do note with some relish, uh, I believe it was just last year that um, Planned Parenthood was Planned Parenthood was removing Margaret Sanger's name from their building, I believe, mm -hmm. in Manhattan, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. I, I did cover it at the time uh, because there was an iota of realization that, oh, perhaps this eugenic ideology, which Sanger was a devout adherent to, might actually be a icky little blemish that we don't want to advertise too much. But she's still a saint on earth. And let's give the Margaret Sanger Award to Hillary Clinton for yeah, I've talked about this. I've talked about this a lot. Uh, Planned Parenthood has denied basically that Sanger was a eugenicist for years and years and years. And on their website for decades, every time you check it, they would have the front page would have the sidebar on it, which was the denial of Sanger as a eugenicist. <laughs> but I mean, just read Pivot of Civilization, her big book, and it's just plain as day, everyone. And I'm sorry, but that's just, just look at the text and I can even send people the text. You email me, I'll send it to you. Um, it's clearly a genesis. Now, that doesn't mean anything though about my position on Planned Parenthood. I generally think they do a good thing. I don't want them to take government money because I don't want to take anyone to take government money, but you know, I, I'm pro-choice essentially. And that, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't discredit the the pro-choice movement, right? But it is absolutely true that it was founded as a eugenicist organization targeting particularly, and this is why black people are, uh, you know, more skeptical about the government putting needles in their arms and other people, right? Was specifically targeting the residents of Harlem and other black neighborhoods in the 1940s, 1950s, et cetera. And even black leaders like W.E.B. Du Bois and others were all for this because they didn't they wanted to winnow out their population, too. They didn't like the drug dealers and, you know, and the pimps and the prostitutes and all those at the bottom of their society. So it's um, now. OK, so. I think eugenics, I, all, I agree with everything you said. I think the progressive mind is very much a scientific mind, or I would actually say a scientistic mind, right? Because they believe, as you were saying, science, the state, but I think also the science is the new God, right? And that's why you- and, and In fact, that's where the technocratic idea comes from, essentially, is the merging of the scientific with the, the state itself, so totally. that the state becomes a scientific- scientific entity. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that's why eugenics made a lot of sense to progressives, or it was very appealing, I should say, because it was a way to, to categorize human beings, which is, you got to do that before you can manipulate them, you know, put them into categories. And then you can finally, then you can decide um, more easily who gets to get sterilized and who gets, you know, 
to get promoted in society and who gets to run the government because we're just going to look at their family, whatever. But um, so, okay, so we've got that connection. We've got why progressives were for eugenics, although there's more to say on that. And by the way, Timothy, have you lit, read Timothy Leonard's book on this, Illiberal Liberals? It's a, I have not. It's a whole oh, book. Oh. Maybe you, I have. I'm, I'm sure <laughs> I've read bits I'm, of it. <laughs> I'm sure you know about it. Yeah, it came out yeah. about five years ago, I want to say. Yeah. It's it's about this very thing. It's about progressivism and eugenics at the turn of the 20th century. Um, okay, so we've got we got eugenics. We know what that was. Forcible sterilization, da 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 Progressives liked it, used by the state. Okay, fine. Now, globalism. You use that term all the time. You talk about it being kind of the dominant ideology of the ruling political elite for a good century. Okay, how's, how are those connected? Why, why would eugenics and progressivism also be part of global, what you call globalism, what others might call a form of imperialism, I suppose? Or I, I wouldn't be opposed to that term. I yeah. just think globalism is more au courant. But yeah, I, I think it uh, it stems from the same ultimate impetus, which shouldn't be uh, for students of history particularly surprising. What has every tyrant or would be tyrant throughout history ever lusted after is control of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, the world may have been smaller at previous times in history, but mm -hmm. you know Alexander the Great wanted him to conquer the known world. These types of it's the same ultimate impetus. So um, it shouldn't be surprising that people with riches and power in our current era want to control the world and everything within it, not just the natural resources, but the human resources as well. And so, as you say, categorizing those resources and then um, deciding what what may be allowed to pass on into the future and what may not is, uh, I, I think, a just a manifestation of that, that ultimate will to conquer everything, which, mm. uh, I, again, is so alien to your nature or my nature that it's yeah. impossible for, I think, for, for us to truly wrap our heads around it. But we have to, at the very least, understand there are people out there with that impulse and they will do what it takes in order to do that. And I, I, I realize this is where a lot of the um, quote unquote normie audience will start to disengage. Well, that's the crazy conspiracy theorizing going on. And yeah. I suppose it is speculative to an extent because none of us can see into the hearts or minds of other other human beings. And we can't know ultimately the, the, the end goals and motivations that are not there on out on the table. But at any rate, there has been a voluminous literature for the past century about creating a say it with me, new world order. Um, there is a reason why that phrase has entered into the conspiracy lexicon. It's because it has been so uh, well used over at least the course of the past century, starting uh, as far as I know, at least uh, with H.G. Wells. What, that science fiction writer who also penned what became the draft of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for the UN and had a lot of profound things to say on a number of subjects, including eugenics, an avowed eugenicist himself, of course, um, who also wrote, the New World Order, talking essentially about technocracy. It was obviously proto-technocracy because technocracy had not been um, formally coined at that point, but talking about how there was going to be a brotherhood of, of scientists and engineers, et cetera, who were going to steward over the world. And of course, it's always, it's a global vision because ultimately it's about humanity and ultimately conquering humanity, although I'm sure they would phrase it slightly differently, but there is going to be a scientific uh, elite that are going to tell everyone else how to live because they will know how to best engineer society because they're the engineers. I mean, come on, it's right in their title. <laughs> what could be more natural than that? Um, mm -hmm. And of course, and as you know, and as I know most of your audience knows, but let's put it out on the table. This elides the fundamental point that you cannot bridge the is ought gap. You can have any amount of data and knowledge about the world for whatever empirical evidence you have, which mm. by the way, let's not ever delve into the fundamental problem that this is mm. inductive knowledge. So we can never, ever, ever, ever establish that it is always true in all settings and, and will forever be true. But anyway, mm. let's rush that to the side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even if you do have certain knowledge about the physical world and the way that it operates, that does not tell you how the world should be run. That is a value judgment. And when you are putting value judgments on this scientific technical elite class, well, they know how to run the world. No, 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 no. They may know how to order the physical properties of the world to make it do this or that. That does not mean they know what is best for you or me or humanity in general. That is madness. And that is the point they never want us to investigate too deeply. Right. It is our choice. We can find out, we can know how deadly COVID is 
but it is not a scientific question as to what to do about it. It's a human question as to what to do about it. Give us the, give us the information about the thing, and then we will decide as human beings what we want to do about it. But that, of course, is not what's been going on. Yeah, um, I want to spend as much time as we can on the Great Reset, which is really a thing. <laughs> the World Economic Forum, really a thing. I, By the way, I was like a little bit skeptical of this stuff until I read your stuff on this. It's it's really mind-blowing. I, I had kind of thought it was conspiracy theorist kooks who were talking about Davos and the all, the Great Reset. And so I, I went to my favorite conspiracy theorist kook, James Corbett, and he convinced me that it's all true. Um, let's do that. And it would be great if you could also connect it to history, you know, these progressives. There's something, what's connecting, let's do that. What's connecting progressives in 1905, 1910 with the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset and the, the party of Davos, as Steve Bannon likes to call it? Uh, as I know you can appreciate, and I hope your audience will be able to appreciate, it's incredibly difficult to do justice to this information in just a short conversation yeah. like this. So I will refer people first, firstly, question mark. Uh, I don't know what order in which to recommend people, but uh, I would suggest that they uh, at the very least look up my big oil documentary, corbettreport.com slash big oil, all one right. word. And that's how big oil conquered the world and why big oil conquered the world. And in, especially in why big oil conquered the world, I think the, the a narrative arc that I was painting there was from that eugenics philosophy in late 19th century England and how that metamorphosed in America and in Nazi Germany into the environmental movement and the population control movement and is m continuing to metastasize mm -hmm. into the technocratic vision of the future. That's kind of the big arc of where we're going and how we got there. But it does connect through specific people and institutions. And in this case, talking about big oil, of course, we're talking about things like the Rockefeller family. Of course, they are the big oil family, right? Well, not just, of course, about oil. In fact, they've all divested. The Rockefeller fund has divested from, from all oil. I mean, great, yay, we, we beat big oil, guys, yay. Maybe that's not the end of the story. So what are they investing in these days? And where have those investments gone? So that is an important part of the story. And part of that is, as I alluded to earlier, um, John D. Rockefeller III setting up the Population Council from the ashes of the American, well, not even the ashes, I suppose it still continued on under different guises, but really the core of the American Eugenic Society just transferred over to the Population Council and continued on their work. Hmm. And the, as I say, the World Wildlife Federation and other things that you would not expect to have such <laughs> weirdly dark roots actually do when you start yeah. to look at the actual people who signed them and the documents that they signed, etc. And that, that brings us to things like the Club of Rome, which okay. in the 19th, it, it, it's a talking shop essentially, and uh, a member's forum for people who are concerned about things like the natural environment. And so in the 1970s, they came up with the limits to growth, which uh, is a document that is profoundly Malthusian in nature. And Malthus is another, I think, an important um, person, not because of uh, the important things that he wrote, but because of the lasting influence of the, the things that he wrote on things like the eugenics movement, that essentially the earth is a small uh, fixed pie. Mm -hmm. And there are more and more greedy, grubby human beings trying to get a piece of that pie. So we have to, we're going to have to decide who gets a piece of this pie and who will be eliminated from the gene pool. I think that's a, a yeah. core part of what is uh, uh, tied in with eugenics and progressivism ultimately, oh. um, which is based on a completely false assumption. If people want more on that, they should read about Julian Simon and the ultimate resource because the ultimate resource on the planet is not iron or tungsten or copper or nickel. It is the human brain. It's us. And, yeah. Um, can I stop you there just for a second? Um, so um, the, the idea is that the Earth's resources are finite, which we know is false. <laughs> and we can get to that in a second. Um, and that the problem, though, is so you have finite resources and greed. Greed combined with finite resources causes scarcity, poverty, right? That makes sense. Like the internal logic makes yes, sense. Yes, yes, yes. It's a profoundly simple and understandable okay. idea. And it seems okay. to make such intuitive sense okay. that how could it be wrong? So it must be right. 
even though it has been wrong for the last two centuries since Malthus was writing. So people <laughs> who don't know, please go back and read yes. Malthus and his population problem, essentially, which was that population or food supply is increasing arithmetically, but population is, is increasing exponentially. Yep. Put two and two together, guys. Within 20 years, England's going to be essentially a barren hellhole of people eating sure. each other's brains because there's no food, etc. Yep. Well, that didn't exactly happen, now did it? It didn't happen in Malthus's lifetime mm. or the lifetime of his descendants or the descendants of his descendants. In fact, it's never happened. This impending crisis is pretty predicted over and over and over and over again for centuries now and wow. never quite comes, but it's always just around the corner. The latest iteration of that, speaking of rock star super scientists, of course, is Paul Ehrlich, who people will know, the population bomb, all of that. Please see a report that I did. Uh, it's at corporatereport.com slash Ehrlich. Fantastic. And it's about Paul Ehrlich, a pseudoscience charlatan who has been wrong about everything, profoundly, ridiculously, laughably wrong with his predictions over and over. Oh, by the year 2000, England's going to be uh, uh, completely out of food and uh, everything's going to be hell in a handbasket, et cetera, completely wrong. Um, but that, that mentality is so ingrained in the population that I think most people don't even realize that they ultimately fully subscribe to it. There are so many people who are absolutely convinced that we are facing this profound overpopulation problem, even as, oh, by the way, it turns out that human fertility is decreasing at an alarming rate. And in fact, you can go and read even in the pages of The Guardian just this past month talking about the end of uh, human fertility by the 2045, according to some scientists, etc. Mm -hmm. I mean, just profound changes that are happening because of these mm -hmm. endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals, uh, plastics that are, that are uh, uh, polluting our environment right now. Now, the mm. real profound environmental problems, but carbon dioxide is the only thing you're allowed to talk about. But anyway, stepping around that minefield for the moment, that brings us to the, uh, the limits to growth in 1970s, which as its title right. might imply, was this document about how, oh, there are limits to growth because look, our, we have only such a finite amount of resources and we're right. running out and we, uh, you know, we're gonna have to find a way to contain the human population, et cetera. Um, now, what does that have to do with the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset? Well, as it turns out, at the World, at the World Economic Forum, um, I believe it's second ever. I'll have to double check on that. But one of its very, very early meetings um, was, uh, was attended and co-chaired. And, the, and the, the central keynote speech was delivered by the, uh, the person who was heading the Club of Rome at that time, talking essentially about the limits to growth, etc. This was organized by this shadowy Klaus Schwab, yeah. who was this guy with a lot of degrees who you can find very little about his actual family history and what, oh, where did he really? come from and who is he and why did he come to this position of prominence? But he started this organization in the right. 1970s that became known as the World Economic uh, uh, right. Forum and which now seems to be this organization through which all of these world leaders and economists and, and business leaders, um, of course, gather in Davos every year. I'm sure everyone's heard about the gathering in Davos, mm -hmm. but now they're launching something called the Great Reset and Prince Charles and John Kerry and all these other people are telling us that uh, we've hit the Great Reset button and there's no going back and humanity is shifting forever. And then you start reading what Klaus Schwab, Klaus Schwab is writing, of course, mm -hmm. his ghostwriter, um, is writing about transhumanism and uh, the, the, we're all going to be transformed and taking brain chips and like actually read his actual writings on this. Don't take conspiracy <laughs> theorist James Corbett for yeah. word for this. No, no. What he says is 10 times crazier. Exactly. That we are facing the ultimate uh, convergence of our biological and technological and digital identities. And we're going to be essentially be uploading our consciousness to the, the, the cloud in the future. Just insanity. But this is what is being openly talked about now in the context of this great reset that's we're being told we're changing the social contract, which I don't remember ever signing. But anyway, <laughs> I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Can I can I fi find a copy of that somewhere so that I can who's who's talking about the changes and alterations to this document that doesn't exist? Oh, that's right. The World Economic Forum, which has appointed itself leaders that is being um, stewarded by people like the Club of Rome talking about the limits to growth and the, the need to curtail the human population. But don't worry your head about that they love you and that's why they're giving you the experimental gene therapy holy christ okay <laughs> i noticed that the world economic forum they pulled it down but they had that video this is about a month ago two months ago fabulous video i was so appreciative that they did that video 
And I was also just blown away that they would do something like that. But they did pull it down and, and it made some sort of apology about it. But basically about all the wonderful things that the lockdowns have done across the world, which is to make cities quieter. I noticed that that was a big one, <laughs> like as if we were asking for that. Um, and of course, the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. They so they're very excited about all these things that the lockdown has done. And they sort of offered it as this, you know, opportunity, you know, to 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 change our ways. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that there are many, many people who are the kinds of people we've been talking about. You call them sociopaths, psychopaths. I call them politicians um, <laughs> or people like Klaus Schwab, who are sort of politicians and what do you would shadow politicians or something like that? Yeah. No, that's an important point. And let's yeah. not alight over that. But that yeah. is an extremely important point. That's I don't good. think that the po political leaders are necessarily the or, or I don't think they are at the capstone of this pyramid of power that seemingly exists. OK, um, just because you hold a a title of president or prime minister doesn't necessarily mean that much as evidenced as we talked earlier by the Italian prime minister and coming out and saying, I had no idea this Operation Gladio even existed. No one told me about it. I guess I wasn't in the loop. So what, what does that say about the actual power of these po politicians who are changed every few years? Talking about, for example, uh, Tragedy and Hope, Carol Quigley, talking about the, the point is to give people a system where they can throw the bums out every four years and nothing will fundamentally change with the agenda that is ongoing. So that implies that, yeah, political leadership is perhaps not the uh, the be all and end all in terms of the actual governing power of society. So Klaus Schwab holds no political office, yet seems to be wielding an awful lot of power and authority. Bill Gates holds no political office, but seems to be wielding a lot of power in our society. It is why it is at least alleged that David Rockefeller said, um, when, when asked, why don't you run for president? He said, I don't wanna take a demotion. <laughs> I think that pretty much says it. Yeah. Well, okay. Now this comes down to sort of theory of theories of the state, and you know, a lot of libertarians would say, of course, it's the government that has ultimate power because they've got the prisons and the guns and the armies and the the biggest corporations in the world, the Standard Oils and Google haven't had those things, and they haven't been able to lock you up in prison, James. But the government has been able to do that. So, but it sounds like. You're you're taking the you know sort of a standard left argument actually right which is that capitalist corporations are really the power that's that's where sovereignty in a sense ultimately lies. Do you is that your take? Is that your position? Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's corporate in nature or that it is the state uh, fundamentally. I think okay. that there are power groupings and institutions okay. that are quasi political, quasi corporate. I don't think that they okay. inhabit a singular sphere. Um, and, but they overlap. And that's why something like, uh, look at an organization like the Council on Foreign Relations, because I mean, again, I'm sure a lot of your audience has at least heard about it, an organization like that. What, what is it exactly? I mean, it is kind of just a think tank. It doesn't actually, I mean, it's not literally an organ of state, yeah. but a lot of people who are in positions in power in the State Department or in other parts of the, the White House, et cetera, are yeah. CFR members, yeah. but that doesn't necessarily, I mean, it overlaps. Of course, there are business leaders in there, but you look at an organization like that and you see a lot of different people in a lot of different positions and you don't necessarily see a singular thing there. It's 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 just people that are grouping. And this is why I, I reject the monolithic conspiracy theory formulation, where it is a singular, it's a one group headed by one person in one smoky room. Uh, no, there are people who are interested in power and they tend to conglomerate in con groupings that are convenient and they will morph and, and overlap and they will backstab and there will be all sorts of, you know, internal politics amongst the elite structures as well, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and to get a, a handle on that, I would, I would go back to a, a lecture that I've promoted a few times in, in recent weeks here by Carol, uh, Carol Quigley, by uh, G. Edward Griffin talking about uh, what he called the Quigley formula. Okay. Um, which was talking about the way that the Cecil Rhodes Roundtable um, mm -hmm. functioned, which was, uh, for people who don't know, Cecil Rhodes, immensely wealthy and uh, politically powerful, but non-politician of the late 19th century, who um, was able to foster an organization. And again, this is admitted, documented history. He, f he fostered a secret secret society with uh, his last one of his seven last wills and testaments um, attested to by William T. Stead and published 
openly and written about in the New York Times. I cover all of this in my World War I conspiracy documentary, uh, mm. corporatereport.com slash WWI. Mm. Um, but uh, uh, the way that his organization was set up to work was that it would not have a name even. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have a name. It wouldn't have any formal institutional structure. There was, there were, there was things that they said, oh, the, the fellowship of the elector, whatever, the society of the elector, whatever they called themselves would be the inner cadre. And they would create these institutions around them and around them, they'd recruit more people. And, but the idea was that there'd be a few people on the very, very inside of this who were directing an agenda that through rings within rings of gradually larger and larger institutional frameworks, they would ultimately be controlling thousands, tens of thousands of people perhaps um, in, in terms of the overall agenda that they were working towards without that, those tens of thousands of people even knowing that that inner cadre existed. And that was specifically what was laid out in the, the, the type of uh, uh, framework that was constructed. And so they chose not to have a formal name. That's why it's sometimes called the Cecil Rhodes Roundtable, but that kind mm -hmm. of mor morphed into Milner's Kindergarten. And there's the RIIA, the Royal Institute of... Oh, Chatham House. Yes, Chatham House, Chatham House and yeah. CFR, and and yeah. so all of these organizations, and they become these sort of spokes, on, and there's a lot, they go out in a lot of different directions, and it's difficult to to pinpoint them. They're not corporate in nature. They're not political in nature. They're, they're some sort of conglomeration of people of power and influence. And, okay, and yeah. that's why it's difficult for people to wrap their heads around it, because, yes, they want to say this is corporate. This is this mm -hmm. is the state. But mm -hmm. power doesn't necessarily work that way. Mm -hmm. Boy, I'm thinking about a lot of stuff here and I'm thinking about corporatism, you know, um, the collaboration of the state and corporations in the management of society, which a lot of my listeners know was the is and was the economic basis of fascism. And it was also the economic basis of the New Deal in the United States. And we all know this, and uh, but we choose to ignore it. Um, but so that has always been thought of, and I've always thought of it as the heads of the major industries sitting down at a table with members of the government. And this is exactly what happened in Italy and Germany and the United States in the 1930s and decide what the prices should be in that industry and what the wages should be in that industry and what they should produce and how much of it, et cetera. Um, but it sounds to me like you're adding another many different factions to this collaboration, right? And I think you're dead right. And I think the sort of intellectual intellectual elite part of it is crucial, right? The Not just the scientists, but the social scientists. In fact, they're probably even more important because the Council on Foreign Relations was journalists. They, it was founded by journalists, all of whom had deep connections and, and longstanding friendships with heads of government. By the way, do you know the original Council on Foreign Relations headquarters in Manhattan was a townhouse? It was there for 60 years or so. Do you know what the townhouse, right? So it's connected to the next house over. Do you know what the next house over was? In other words, whose house did they share a wall with? It was the house I'm of- I'm sure I knew this at some point, but you're going to have to refresh my memory. This is everything right here. The, it was the house that was owned by Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, yeah. On East, East 65th Street. You guys yeah. can look it up. Yeah, everyone can look it up. Um, but <laughs> there, you, there you go. I mean, they shared a wall with the Roosevelts, okay? Right before the Roosevelts took power, by the way. It was in the 20s and 30s when they, when they were neighbors. So yeah, but but yes, we there is this collaboration among various elite groups, not just the state and big corporations, right? That constitute, you know, what Marxists would call the ruling class. I'm fine with that too, by the way. Yeah. You know, other people call it the ruling elite, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Um, that's really important. And that's yes, it is. And uh, and yeah, just to circle back to what we talked about earlier with that potentially apocryphal David Rockefeller quote, ha ha ha, I don't want to take a demotion. But there is something to that, that the Rockefeller family yeah. achieved incredible power and influence, not through, well, with the exception of Nelson, but even then I was vice presidential, but not through political office, but through philanthropy, right. Right. which is this bizarre it, what is that? That's not corporate. Yeah. It's not state. It's it's granted by the state as a sort yeah. of privilege to these philanthropic foundations to act in tax exempt ways, etc. That was invested by the yeah. Reese Committee in the 1950s. That's a whole other thing. But so what is that? And that, of course, serves as a template for someone like Bill Gates, who takes his vast fortune and yeah. I'm going to give it away the giving pledge, etc. Oh, I'm such a benevolent human being who has doubled his 
fortune in the past decade of decade of vaccines, as he himself turned it in 2010. Um, there's right. something profoundly important about that that uh, speaks to that nebulous nature of this. It is not necessarily corporate. It is not necessarily state. It's it's the con con combination of those in various ways. And I, I, I don't think looking at it from one or other of those perspectives is particularly helpful. Uh, I, yeah, I, we're, I think we're on the same wavelength here, but, but the, the one partner <laughs> in the partnership could put everybody else in prison and no one else could, right? I mean, the state could have put Rockefeller in prison. They could have killed Rockefeller, right? They could have ignored Rockefeller. They could have not joined with him. I mean, and Rockefeller can't do the same to the state. So even, don't, I mean. Well, that's true um, because the state is, is not an actual entity. It's a thing, but, uh, but it's composed of human beings who themselves are compromised in various ways, presumably. But, but the state sure needed Rockefeller's oil, didn't it? Right? And yeah. so, yeah, he had quite a bit of power in those negotiations, if there was. Well, a exactly power. right. And yeah. so where do these politicians come from and how are they groomed and processed? And why do we have in the United States, for example, this two party system that cannot be challenged, that right. the candidates must come up through the? I mean, again, right. we get into so many different topics here. I, I will parenthetically also exhort, <laughs> this is just a bibliography of my own work, uh, essentially, but That's I great. will exhort people, if they're interested in what you talked about earlier, the importance of social scientists and their place in this, I'll, I'll uh, point them back to uh, History is Written by the Winners, which was a podcast follow-up that I did to my World War One conspiracy documentary, talking specifically about um, how the, the teaching of history in the United States was taken over by the philanthropic foundations and their their affiliated institutions in the post mm -hmm. post World War One era, essentially, um, as a way of essentially get, get, gaining control of the the apparatus of the what would become the state state department, etc., through getting the minds of the most promising young up and comers in the uh, in the academy, essentially. Yeah, the. Uh... To finish on the robber barons piece, you know, I mean, you're you're basically right. And I mean, they're a fascinating group. And again, they're these people like who made more money than anyone had ever had in, in human history, yet continued to work night and day, just like Bill Gates does. Like, how strange is that? Can you imagine you're a billionaire and you continue to work eight, 10, 12 hours a day? What is yeah. that? I am not doing that. It's I profoundly strange. But interesting. Yeah. Also, this connects back to that same progressive uh, uh, thing we we're talking about earlier and the backgrounds of those progressives. Uh, look at John D. Mm -hmm. Rockefeller and his devout progressive uh, Protestant background and his mm -hmm. Protestant work ethic. And he was and and he framed it in religious terms. Competition is a sin. No, there are many ways to read that statement. Not all of them are flattering to Rockefeller, right? You compete with me, you are a sinner and you will right. be smited. Right. But competition is a sin and I'm saintly. And so we won't compete. We'll, we'll start a philanthropic foundation, etc. And yeah, and so devote your life to this great project. And what is the great project? Is it about building up humanity or building up the kingdom of heaven on earth? Yeah. As essentially was what the original progressive founding ideology was, was about build, yeah. building the kingdom of heaven on earth through the state. Right. Um, but of course that gets corrupted for human ends, shall we say? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, these guys, Andrew Carnegie, John Rockefeller, etc., they made ginormous fortunes, historic fortunes, but then didn't spend it on themselves. And as you said, they spent it on their philanthropies, right? They gave away, Carnegie, I think, gave away basically all of his money to that, right? And that's why we have the names Carnegie and Roosevelt, I mean, Rockefeller and Roosevelt, <laughs> Rockefeller all over everything. Yeah. Um, and Max Weber, the German social scientist writing at the turn of the 20th century was like, what's up with that? That is so strange. What was motivating these guys? And that's what I'm always getting at. You've, you've had, by the way, the most interesting and sophisticated analysis of motivations that I've ever heard anyone put forward. Um, but from Weber, it was that they simply wanted to be like fathers to the world. They wanted to be this great paternalistic figure with their money. They wanted to uplift the masses, meaning uplift them into their own cultural institutions and assimilate exactly. them into the, the dominant real culture. power. The real exactly. power, again, is not political in the in that sense. It's it's having control over the destiny of, of humanity and the world, ultimately. And this, this relates to the funny little jest that the Rockefeller boys had, the uh, the, the 
third generation, um, David and his brothers, yeah. um, when they were growing up, they, they used to joke about divvying up the world. <laughs> and, you know, um, David would get Europe and then uh, Nelson would get uh, uh, North America or blah, blah, blah. But and then they'd always joke that Winthrop would get, you know, uh, Arkansas or something. Uh, uh, you know. But a lot can be said about that jest that they used to play, yeah. divvying up the world between themselves. Yeah. OK, let's do a couple things here in history, because, you know, I'm a historian. I like this stuff. I'm writing about it right now. So World War One. What was World War One? James Corbett, what was it really about to you? <laughs> In, in well, two was sentences. World War One. Two, two uh, sentences. Two sentences. I mean, yeah, you know, two sentences. Well, I, I, I could and have done an entire documentary about. Oh, this. I know. Um, I know. Yeah. It, it it was related to the the progressive project, obviously. Um, Woodrow Wilson. Mm -hmm. Um, but who were the forces that were behind him, and in, in what ways? Uh, this has to do with a lot of things. Um, one thing that I will cite is Thucydides' trap. Um, which is uh, much discussed in, in foreign policy these days, which is essentially that historically speaking, generally more time, more often than not, when you have a rising, a, an established world hegemon that is threatened by a rising new power, you are going to have conflict. And that is one way of framing what happened between Germany and the United Kingdom in World War I. Hmm. Um, uh, but that's that's a little bit too easy. But I think at, at any rate, it also captures the, the the moment that we're living through with the United States and China, but fails completely to understand the actual dynamic of that relationship and how, in fact, the, the rising China didn't just come out of nowhere. It was actually specifically brought into the position of um, mm -hmm. economic and ultimately geopolitical consequence that it, it has uh, enjoyed it for the past couple of decades, mm -hmm. deliberately so, as part of 3D chess, which I, we can get into if you want. Um, and there was definitely 3D chess going on in the World War I situation, but part of it was um, the profound shift in mentality. Uh, if you want to look specifically at the United States, the profound shift in mentality about the reach and power of the state mm. and what the state can and should be permitted to do mm -hmm. um, that that whatever social contract existed pre World War One was radically altered by World War One mm -hmm. itself and uh, the the American uh, public I think were profoundly altered in that experience and came to a different understanding of the role of the state and uh, that is a main emphasis of the part three of my World War One conspiracy where I look at sort of the way that that things that would have been unthinkable before the war suddenly became so completely thinkable that they're now well of course how could it be any other way and one example that I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, growing up in Canada, I always heard pointed to was, well, the income tax was just a temporary measure to fund World War I. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. At least in the Canadian context, that was true. Right. Um, so there you go. Uh, and I also think that there's a, 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 an incredibly profound um, thread that I have not seen explored very deeply of monetary history uh, and geopolitical history. Yep. And uh, it is no coincidence that the Federal Reserve was founded in 1913, really came into existence in 1914, just as America was being prepared to head into World that was, War, which that was so it. lucky. That was so lucky. <laughs> yeah, just a nice coincidence, I suppose. Yeah. That was, right. uh, of course, helped with the financing of the war and then ultimately building up the the the, the infrastructure for the financing of World War II, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, such a profoundly important story that has not been told with any justice or that I've seen at any rate, or at least not the the uh, it's not well known enough. Mm -hmm. So um, there's some really important things going on with that. Um, th this silly, it was about the Archduke of uh, Franz Ferdinand and the assassination. And I, I think everyone knows that that's just, that's just a trigger point, but obviously it was not about that. And it was not just about the madness of uh, the Prussian King who just completely was this bloodthirsty war tyrant, et cetera, et cetera. No, there were, there were profound cultural monetary um, and geopolitical uh, thing, uh, dealings that were going on that mm -hmm. I can't sum up in a couple of sentences, but that this was part of essentially a uh, leading towards a, a, a world uh, conflagration that has been termed um, by uh, John P. Kafferke as Lord Milner's second war. Oh. And he goes in a great degree of detail about um, uh, Lord Milner and his role in uh, essentially preparing uh, the UK for the UK's role in that war and uh -huh. how that was ultimately transferred to America. Another important book on that regard is Hidden History um, by uh, 
Doherty and McGregor, which I would highly recommend um, that goes through this history in a way that it's out there. And again, this is so well documented, right. um, but so few historians have put those particular pieces together. I would venture to say precisely because of that, what I referred to earlier, the takeover of the teaching mm -hmm. of American history uh, in the post-war period. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Cecil Rhodes. Uh, Cecil Rhodes was the great colonialist, basically almost, you could call him the colonial theorist of the British empire in a way. And his maybe central argument was that colonialism, British colonialism was good for the people it colonized, that it, that it made the lives of Africans and Indians better and that what they were doing was a godly mission. And well, as a matter of fact, they did improve the infrastructure tremendously in those countries that they colonized and much, other, much else. The economies improved, people from those countries now had access to the home, the motherland, you know, in Great Britain and England. That's why we have so many Indians and Pakistanis in England. And Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson, devout Christian, right? He said that what the reason he wanted the United States to go out into the world was to Christianize, this is his words, Christianize the world. And he, I think he believed it, you know? So aren't Andrew Carnegie said that, you know, he felt a godly duty to give his money to the people to uplift them. Of course, it, they're always talking about uplifting into a particular culture, which just happens to be their own culture. <laughs> um, so it's, it's undeniably imperialism, but you know, this is not, would you, do you believe them that that was their motivation? That's what they said their motivation was. At various levels. Yeah, I, I believe so. Uh, as I say, everyone wants to be the hero of their story and wants to believe they're mm -hmm. doing good. And I think some of these people genuinely did believe that. And yes, they perhaps did not um, scrutinize their own position so much as to really look at, oh, well, the fact that I am always put posting my own position in my own society as the penultimate or as the ultimate uh, for humanity is somewhat telling. But yes, uh, Cecil Rhodes specifically started his organization with the specific idea that it was going to be the essentially the, the globalization of the British Empire. The British Empire over Uber Alice essentially yeah. was was the motivation that Rhodes had specifically. But that what he started was quite quickly taken over um, by Lord Milner for mm. different ends and ultimately got uh, forwarded into the 20th century and and, and onwards um, and started to become, well, it's not so much about the British Empire, it's about merging the British and American Empire. And then it's kind of just about, well, the American Empire. And I, I posit it's now going to be about, well, the American Sino Empire or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it will continue to morph because it's not fundamentally a nation state structure that we're dealing with. Power transcends that completely. Again, do not take my words for it. Take the words of someone like, uh, uh, David Rothkopf, um, oh, Minnie yeah. Kissinger. He was the head of Kissinger's and Associates for a long time, writes for foreign policy, etc. Yeah. He wrote a decade and a half ago about superclass, about how there is this elite group of 6,000 people who uh, are able to in, in, transact and, and to interact and to uh, uh, accomplish uh, agendas that transcend national national sovereignty uh, th that already exists there is this wow. superclass he wrote about it it's called superclass go read oh. it for yourself and oh, he wow. he basically brags yes there is this thing and it may not be inclusive enough we need to get more women in this establishment etc but <laughs> it's ultimately you know it's an admission in his own words that yes this already exists oh that's great i've been following rothkopf for a while by the way it's r-o-t-h k-o-p-f right david rothkopf yeah and so he's a big democrat uh, foreign policy guy, sort of a, not in, not in uh, cabinet, but he's been one of the main advisors, but yeah, he drives me nuts. Um, incredible smugness. Mm -hmm. But then again, I'd be smug too, if I, you know, helped run the world. The, um, so he's, so this is sort of a, he's happy about this, this, this existence of a 6,000 person global elite that really runs things. Right. That's, he's saying this is a good thing. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah right. because he's part of it. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, please go check out David Rothkopf. Um, God, he's annoying. Okay, so, mm. and a great defender of the status quo, the establishment, NATO, UN, all that stuff. All right. People are going to definitely want to get your takes on some a couple of things here, as do I. Um, <clears throat> so let's finish out by doing what we can in the time we have on these things. So, all right. You do a lot on 9-11. And I got to admit, James, you know, that scared me when I first saw it. But then I watched like the first 10 minutes of your, the first thing I saw on 9-11. I was like, holy shit, 
Giuliani said that? Really? Then? No kidding. Oh my God, he said it on camera. Oh, here's the footage of him saying it on camera. Then he's saying it op the opposite thing a few days later. Like, just off the bat, you're giving me stuff that is just like plain as day, true. I mean, verified by major media news sources that I did not know about. Did I simply, and I've been following this stuff pretty closely all the time, my whole life, you know? So that's really remarkable. But I always said about sort of 9 11 conspiracy theories trutherism, I'm putting up air quotes for the for the audio listeners, um, that I love the politics behind it, the political sort of impulse, the psychology behind it, right? That it, that it, I mean, I used to end my lectures about 9-11 by saying that it was the best thing that ever happened to the neocons and also others who are in line with them, like, I guess, neoliberals, whoever wants the, the American empire to continue, right? That seems indisputable to me that it was a great thing for globalists and all of all sorts, right? Um, beyond that, I just don't know. I haven't looked at the damn building seven, you know, steel melt point, da da da, you know. <laughs> but what can you, um, what has been your, well, let me ask you this what did you think the day of 9 11? What was your first, what was your first instinct about it? Well, I was fresh out of university. I just uh, uh, graduated. So I was in my first real jobby job um, working in a commercial real estate office downtown Calgary. Um, so that day I had gotten off the train going into work and a coworker, I met a coworker and she said something about having seen a plane, World Trade Center accident. I was like, oh, is going to crash or something? I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And so I got into work and started checking the news and suddenly... 9-11 is happening and all this stuff's going down and people got the radio on in the office and uh, we're listening. I remember listening to the report. Uh, there's been a bombing at the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. Bombing what? And it was reported as a bomb at the time. And and then I remember a, another coworker coming in and me not quite reading the atmosphere. Oh, good morning. And he's just absolutely ashen faced saying, I just saw the World Trade Center collapse and everything. And I remember riding the train home that that night and it was eerie absolutely eerie completely dead silent on the mm. train and everyone listening to somebody had a transistor radio and we we're listening to the radio of the mm. you know what was going on and stuff and so that night i started watching the coverage and just trying to soak it all in i didn't so i didn't see it as it was happening i was working as it was happening but uh, we even evacuated one of our buildings downtown calgary because calgary. <laughs> some of the planes were being diverted to canada so oh, okay. you know, whatever it was just craziness um so I didn't really process it all on that day. And I, 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 like everyone else, I was subjected to the imagery that was repeated ad nauseum in the days and weeks and months after that. And then what few people seem to remember anymore, of course, anthrax followed shortly yeah. thereafter. But I remember because I was the one opening the mail every day. So people would often joke, oh, if you find any white powdery substances, don't bring it over here. <laughs> but it was kind of serious you know, amongst the laughter. Um, so yeah, a, a weird and profoundly shocking event, but I was young, naive. I knew very little about the world at that time. And so I, I took it uh, mostly at face value. I have been a person who has questioned authority in various ways over my life. And I, I never thought Oswald acted alone and all that kind of stuff, but 9-11, mm, okay. uh, that's that crazy conspiracy theorizing. I don't, you know, that's ridiculous. And so I completely discounted, discounted any sort of conspiracy theorizing on that regard hmm. until 2006. Okay. And that was when I had my rabbit hole experience. And that involved, actually, it was when I was in Japan here, I was just moving into a new apartment. It came with an internet connection. And it was the first time in years that I'd had the internet in my home. I'd had to go to internet cafe phase to basically, you know, get, get my news, download emails, etc. So I, now I had a connection at home for the first time in years. And all of a sudden there's all these new services like YouTube and Google video and stuff. So mm -hmm. I could browse to my heart's content. And I was always interested in, in the world in politics and stuff. So I was, I was watching documentaries. I was watching the daily show and the Colbert report and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> I was, I was a good citizen <laughs> until I started getting these recommendations to these videos on the sidebar of YouTube back in 2006 oh. about these crazy conspiracy, 9-11 conspiracy things. And just sometimes as a joke, I would click on them. Oh, what nonsense is this going to feed me? Right. And it would often be nonsense about flying orbs and whatever. Uh -huh, look at that stupid nonsense. But I don't, I, to this day, I don't, I don't know if there was a single thing that I clicked on or whatever. But at some point, I started encountering some information that I thought, oh, pff, that sounds ridiculous, until I start checking it out. 
Operation Northwoods. Well, what's that? I that sounds like. And then I could go to uh, the National Security Archives and look up the Operation Northwoods documents and read them for myself. And oh, oh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff had signed off in 1962 on a plan to commit and stage terror attacks, including remote controlling planes dressed up to look like regular passenger planes, exploding them over the seas and blaming it on Cuba in order to justify an invasion of Cuba, all waiting on uh, Kennedy's desk for his signature, would have gone ahead. But he didn't, so it didn't. And so it got buried in the archives and actually released, interestingly enough, as part of the uh, JFK Records Act of 92 or whatever, which was part of the Mm -hmm. uproar over the JFK Oliver Stone movie caused Mm -hmm. people to care enough. Uh, Speaking of apathy, people cared about that issue because they saw a Hollywood movie about it. So they get the JFK Records Act and they start the the Records Review Board. And part of that declassification, they declassify the Operation Northwoods documents. uh, And that comes to light in... Uh, I think it was 99 that was first dug up and it was even being reported on in 2001, I want to say, in the Washington Mm -hmm. Post by uh, James Bamford writing Mm -hmm. about it. Oh, there's this plan for the government to stage terror attacks and blame it on their enemy in order to gain political um, uh, position from that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then several months later. But anyway, um, so it was things like that. It was just little nuggets of information that I was inclined to dismiss, but I... I checked myself and I, I went and actually looked up the documents and saw, oh, well, that's actually true. Oh, well, actually, yes, there was this French newspaper report of CIA and intelligence officials meeting with bin Laden in uh, in the spring of 2001. And oh, there was that CBS report that aired uh, uh, once in, in fall of 2001 that yes, bin Laden had been in Rawalpindi on September 10th, 2001, under the watchful eyes of Pakistan intelligence and thus, of course, the CIA. But you know, those, t- those little nuggets that you can actually find. Oh, that's a real thing. I can actually verify that. Oh, that really was reported. There's the actual document. Mm-hmm. And that process of me actually starting to look my, myself for the information started me along that process. So that was how ultimately I came to do what I do, um, was that process of starting to find those documents and piecing them together for myself. And then it leads to one thing and then another and then another and then it becomes the Corbett Report. So um, I, I completely understand where you're coming from, looking at this at first and going, ah, that 9-11 conspiracy theorizing. Um, and it's, it, again, it's a, such a, a, an inherently understandable narrative. As, I mean, Adam Curtis has made an entire documentary out of this narrative, which sure. is taking very interesting pieces and, and then taking them in the most establishment friendly way possible. <laughs> Taking, looking at, for example, The Power of Nightmares is a great documentary in a lot of ways, Hmm. but its fundamental failing is to look at the psychology of the neocons and read their surface level statements 100% at face value. Hmm. What they say is their motivation is their motivation for Hmm. sure. Yes, Bush really did believe he was on a mission from God and he really did control the Bush administration, of course. It was Bush who was directing that, of course. Who else could it have been? And <laughs> so that, that's what it is. The neocons were just the, the mirror image of Al-Qaeda, who, again, were 100% Al-Qaeda. They are what they say they are, were, what we're told they are. Actually, it was constructed in a New York court, courtroom, as even uh, Adam Curtis t- admits in the Power of Nightmares documentary. He has a whole oh. section on that. But anyway, yeah, it's 100% face value. It is Al-Qaeda who is this Muslim enemy, and it is the neocons who are these Christian crusaders, and that is the narrative. Don't question the motivation of any of that. Don't question who, where the real power center is here, or don't look at the history of al Qaeda and how it developed in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Don't look at any actual documentable history. Just take the narrative, because it's an easy narrative to understand. So I understand why people dismiss this, but I hope people can overcome their mental hurdles at least enough to look into the actual documentation behind something like this. And when they're ready for that, I would suggest looking at something like my 9-11 Trillions documentary, my 9-11 Whistleblowers documentary, my 9-11 War Games documentary, where I do go through the documentable evidence. um, Where, long story short, 100% 100% what we have been told as the official story of 9-11 in, as enshrined in the 9-11 Commission report is a lie. Hmm. Uh, it is 100%. It is not true. Uh, the 9-11 Commission report itself based largely almost, to an incredibly large extent on torture testimony derived from waterboarding KSM 183 times, threatening to cut the throats of his children, et cetera, et cetera, until he confessed to being the mastermind to 9-11 A to Z. And oh, by the way, also confessed to uh, wanting to uh, bomb a, a bank in Washington state that didn't even exist until after he was caught 
and things like this. I mean, he wow. would have confessed to being the Easter Bunny, of course. But anyway, this is where we get the 9-11 Commission report and the official fairy tale. Um, but there are documents out there that prove that this is not true. And there are people with valuable information that put, put it, other parts of that story in place. The thing that is not, I think, satisfying to anyone is that when, so they say, well, then James, what did happen on 9-11? I don't know. Of course, I don't know. I do not know the story. I am not a criminal prosecutor with access to subpoena to be able okay. to drag people in and to, to actually get to the bottom of this. I don't have access to the, the classified documents to the extent that classified documents exist to prove exactly what happened on that day. But I know we were lied to and I can demonstrate that and prove that and profoundly lied to on very important par parts of that story. And anyone who doesn't have the intellectual curi curiosity to go beyond that surface le level, Adam Curtis, Noam Chomsky, acceptable level of critique of, of, of what happened that day, I don't know how to help you at this point. But as, as always, as I knew it would happen, I knew that at the point at which profoundly important information starts to become declassified about this, you know, 50 years down the road, as we were saying earlier, yeah, right, right. it will be a, it will be a non-entity. Oh, whatever. 9-11 <laughs> was a lie. Oh, well, who cares? Which was unthinkable when I started talking about this. Yeah. I mean, it was a driving political issue that the world was facing, but that is so yesterday's news. Now, coronavirus is the only thing in the world we can think about. And mm -hmm. oh, what, even if it were to come out, oh yeah, you know, the Bush regime did 9-11, whatever. Anyway, coronavirus, coronavirus, we have to lock down. It, this is the way the world is driven is by convenient narratives that just have to last long enough to get us to the next convenient narrative. We're definitely going to talk about coronavirus, but I want to finish on 9-11 here. So what are the, what are the, to you, the most, the facts that are most troubling to the dominant narrative? For me, uh, I understand why people are so drawn to the physical fireworks of that day, yeah. the physical, what happened to the buildings, etc. And I'm, I certainly don't dismiss that, but that was never what really profoundly interested me about that day. Yes, okay, how did the buildings come down, etc. You know, how did um, Flight 93 go down is interesting questions. But if even if you were to know the definitively the answers to all of those physical phenomena that happened on that day, that doesn't explain the story mm -hmm. of what actually happened and who was what. Um, interestingly, one piece of fiction that I would recommend to wrap your mind around something like that is American Tabloid by James Elroy, which oh, is yeah. about, um, it, it's about the JFK assassination, but yeah. told from the level of a sort of one of the, the street, street level operators that would have been involved in this massive operation. And you get the profound sense when reading that, that fiction, you, you get the profound sense of how you could have a piece of information that, and, and actually know what was happening on the ground that day as JFK gets assassinated, but it doesn't tell you about the bigger plot. You may have one piece of that and someone else has another piece and someone else has another piece. So that's the way I think th these types of operations tend to work, um, yeah. which has derailed me enough that I forget what your actual question was. Oh yeah, just what's a, give a list of a few of the pieces of evidence that you found that you found. Okay, yes, 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 yes. So, most, so what interests me is more the, the sort of broader picture things. Yeah, so right. I, I, I find it profoundly interesting the, the actual formation of what we come to, came to know as Al-Qaeda. Okay. Um, its actual history in Afghanistan in the 80s and how that ties into stories like J. Michael Springman at the Jeddah Consulate issuing visas for Al-Qaeda. That's the name of his book, um, talking about how he was working there in the late 1980s, issuing, being told to issue visas for applicants that were clearly uh, should have been denied visas to come into the United States, um, mm. completely being overridden time and again by mm. his uh, superiors and eventually sort of forced out of the office, uh, gets back to Washington talking to some of his sources and goes, what, what was going on there? It's, uh, you were running in Al, uh, what we now call Al-Qaeda agents into the United States for training in the US so they could be shipped, off, shipped back off to Afghanistan to fight the freedom war back when, of course, right. these were the freedom fighters putting us on the path to freedom. Um, things like that that connect into the sort of more fundamental question of what is, uh, the, I mean, and that goes back to the history of the Muslim Brotherhood and its relation to British intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. The, the, perhaps these organizations that we are told unproblematically, it's just these religious extremists that kind of arise out of the ashes of, or, or out of the dust storms of the, uh, the Middle East. Maybe mm. there is actual historical reasons why 
these organizations exist and why these particular organizations and these particular leaders get fostered and, and funded. And then, and then when you start to drill down on any of the details on any of the parts of the story, like for example, the, the, the hijackers, well, they, these were devout Muslim fundamentalists who did this for their, you know, the glory of their God. And oh yeah, they lived with pink haired strippers and uh, snorted cocaine and, uh, and, uh, we're training at the Hoffman Aviation in uh, in St. Petersburg that also was owned by a guy who owned a Learjet that was caught with 43 kilograms of heroin. And then there were the implications that Jeb Bush was on the C-130 that was flying those particular records out of Hoffman Aviation the day after 9-11 that he was asked wow. about on the campaign trail a few years ago. And, oh, what a weird question. I I uh, know I was in the o emergency operations center in Florida. I had nothing to do with that, but there's a much, much crazier story to that than huh. has ever been let on. Um, and looking at, the, uh, again, it's about the bigger picture. It's about the money trail, for example, okay. literally gets a sentence in the 9-11 commission report. We don't know how the hijackers were funded, but ultimately that is of little practical significance to direct quote. Well, actually, no, it's of profound significance. It <laughs> ties into such things as, well, we know, for example, the, the money trail, documentably $100,000 was being wired in in the weeks prior to Mohammed Atta from Mahmoud Ahmed of Pakistan's ISI, which of course was an adjunct and creation of the CIA. Um, and who was Mahmoud Ahmed and what was he doing? Oh, he was in Washington on 9-11, meeting with Bob Graham and Porter Goss, who would later lead the official congressional inquiry into 9-11. Um, what were they talking about? Well, don't ask them because they will uh, absolutely end the interview then and there, as has been done when uh, citizen journalists, not actual journalists, of course, citizen journalists went and actually asked, I believe it was Bob Graham, uh, about this encounter. Maybe it was Porter Goss. Asked him, what were you talking about with Mahmoud Amis? Uh, uh, the only people who would ask it were citizen journalists, again, because who needs wow. to know little trivial details like that? And then, of course, as has come out with the 28 pages, which actually got a bit of mainstream play, mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a bigger story to it. But anyway, we at least know that, yeah, oh, okay. So some of these hijackers were living with FBI informants in California in the months prior to uh, the, the, the events themselves. We know about, for example, the CIA had information about some of these people coming into the states that they, they deliberately hid um, from other sections of the government and the FBI. And, and we know about uh, able danger and that program, which had identified several of these people beforehand, but they were told not to pursue them, et cetera, et cetera. We know about, I mean, I, 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 my mind boggles. I know too much information to be able to put it all out, but there's so many different pieces of this puzzle that most people will never have heard about and will never hear about again because they're told 9-11 commission report, it's done, it's history. Okay, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I it's an avalanche of stuff that is very persuasive. And now I'm trying to figure out what to do with it. <laughs> you know, I mean, then so if the official narrative is completely wrong and all these things you're saying are right. Then the only the only option here, right, is that the United States government was behind it in some way. I mean, is there any other conclusion? Well, you can draw? again, again. I think that that goes back to that idea that it is the state, the corporations, ah. the military. Again, I, uh, what does that mean? Yeah. The government, okay. the mailman? No, nice. I mean, who specifically and in nice. what positions and yeah. what way did they collaborate and with whom? Nice. Yes, were there elements within the US government? Absolutely, I think there are people within the US government with actual information about what really happened that day. But there, that doesn't mean the US government was behind it. And uh, there were clearly, there were other intelligence agencies and others that clearly had wind of what was happening that day at the very least. People are going to be going to your site uh, as they listen to this. I know it. Uh, and I watch hope it. so. Oh, definitely. Yeah, they're going to learn a lot. Yeah, no, I'm telling you that your stuff, for those of you who don't, have, don't know James's work, I mean, it is, it is rich, it is dense, and it is incredibly well-researched. And there is nothing in there that I've ever seen that sounds flaky. Um, but you judge for yourselves, everyone. Um, I am, you know, I took a risk by having you on here, but I, I stand by this hundred percent. So, um, a thousand percent, because I agree with you, like enthusiastically, like <laughs> energetically last thing. So COVID, we got to do this, um, COVID worldwide conspiracy by the global elite to enslave us. James Corbett, is that the story? <laughs> in, a, in a nutshell, yes. <laughs> I know. You need documentation on that? Because I got and it. Thanks for coming by. Okay. <laughs> Next show will be about puppies. Okay. 
what uh yeah i mean let's see where do we start here uh my goodness all right so i know you've done some stuff on china what's your take on the origin yeah okay excellent question and an important question and one that again i do not have a definitive answer for because okay. again i'm not in a position to know but i do know that um yeah. any fingers that are pointing at china in this story are at the very least equally pointing or in the childish thing oh it's one finger pointing out three for pointing back at you mm -hmm. um with if you're looking at wuhan institute of virology which why not? Yes, they were conducting yep. gain of function research on coronaviruses before mm -hmm. this happened. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were people literally warning about it in the pages of nature and other things mm -hmm. saying, look, this gain of function research is dangerous. And then one of the head gain of function researchers becomes the person who, I, without even the knowledge of some of the other people who become co-signatories to the big refutation that this had anything to do with gain of function research, writes about, no, it's totally natural in origin, guys, and has nothing to do with the gain. Anyway, yeah, there's a lot of uh, um, how do I say the skullduggery and uh, shenanigans going on with regard to that? Sure. But where does this point to? Well, how about the US aid funding that was going to that research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and how right. that ties back? It, that, by the way, was taking place illegally because that function, uh, that gain of function research was actually banned for some section of the uh, Obama administration for a few years there anyway. Yep. And it was still being funded. It was still yep. going on. So there's, I mean, some profound questions about what was going on there. And then where do we tie that into? Do, how about the, uh, the, the World Olympic Games that was taking place uh, in Wuhan uh, in October of 2019, not the Olympic Games, the uh, military. Yeah, games, military. Yeah, military yeah, yeah. games that was taking place in Wuhan on the same day in October of 2019 that Event 201 was taking place by the auspices of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Johns oh, Hopkins Center, etc., um, talking about a globally spreading coronavirus pandemic and what would we do to stop it? Now, this is so there's a lot of pieces that are circumstantial. Of course, they are circumstantial. I do not have signed documents mm -hmm. or whatever to say this was all done on purpose or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I, what I can say, and with, with a great degree of certainty, because I documented it 2008, I had an episode of my podcast on medical martial law, talking about all of the pieces, oh. uh, the infrastructure uh, that has been set up from at the very least the anthrax attacks of 2001 to that time in 2008 to implement medical martial law in the event of a declared public health emergency of international concern, a PHEIC, which was instituted in the 2006 uh, international health regulations that was passed by the World Health Organization, to which pretty much every country on the planet is a signatory, and which allows an incredible range of things to happen, including up to um, even United Nations military intervention in countries that they deem are a, a part of the threat. So that that is something that could happen as a result of these types of declared emergencies. So I, I've seen this coming for a very long time, the, the pieces being put in place from quarantines, forced vaccinations, whatever, in the event of a declared crisis. So my my sense of this is that ultimately, yes, it, of course, it is It is important for historical record, it is important for justice, etc., that we do discover what actually happened and who was actually to blame. But even if this was a completely natural phenomenon that is 100% as they say it is, mm -hmm. at any rate, we know that this was the sort of crisis that is the trigger in the Archduke Franz Ferdinand kind of sense. Okay. Well, there was a trigger event right. that caused this preordained machination of all right. this institutional framework and everything to go into, into yeah. operation. Yeah. That is more of the, the point of this, that the entire institutional yeah. framework for this has been laid carefully yeah. over the past two decades, and it is now being it, put into action. It is that certain people saw it as an opportunity, right? Primarily, primarily. Not as a crisis, but an opportunity. Okay, now what um, an opportunity to do what, Mr. Conspiracy? Uh, to essentially take us into the next stage of the ongoing perpetual crisis, which is the uh, ultimate ruling, um, uh, the, the principle uh, by which the, the, the population is ruled. Um, keep the population in crisis constantly, um, mm -hmm. constantly told there is a boogeyman or a threat and that the only way to save ourselves from this is to essentially prostrate, prostrate ourselves before the, the would-be authorities. In this case, they are the health authorities who will tell us how to keep ourselves safe by keeping ourselves locked inside with masks on and then take experimental gene therapy to make it all better. Um, uh, so uh, uh, 
remind me of the question? <laughs> Just what's it all about, brother? What's like, it all about? Yeah. So the, <laughs> the principle by which um, we are going to be ruled in this new era that we're kind of stepping into right now um, mm -hmm. was best articulated by Giorgio Agamben, who is an Italian philosopher who has um, for quite some, uh, quite a respected philosopher who has come under a lot of fire uh, over the past year because right. he has correctly, I think, identified right. the new governing principle for society, which is, is going to be biosecurity, mm -hmm. uh, in, in right. which we are not just, um, we're not just allowed to access health, health care, or he as, as we see fit. No, we are now going to be juridically obliged to be healthy. And that, of course, is going to be uh, ultimately, it's going to be the state's imprimatur. You are healthy, you are not. And of course, that is the vaccine passport, which crazy conspiracy theorists like myself have been talking about and blaring the alarm about this since the very beginning of this ginned up crisis. I've been talking about this. And interestingly, I was the crazy conspiracy theorist for suggesting that was going to happen a year ago. And now that I'm saying, look, See what they're doing? That's a bad thing. Now I'm a crazy misinformation conspiracy theorist for suggesting it's a bad thing. Of course it's going to happen and you're going to love it. Um, at any rate, anyone, I, I have throughout my work, I've had real empathy for people who are just coming into this information, who are skeptical, who, oh, that's conspiracy theorizing because I myself was there. I was there in 2006. I've been there. I know that mentality. So I, I completely understand it. I've always had empathy and I've always tried to lead people into this information lately. But something that I have really cogitated on for the 14 years I've been doing this now, I have often thought, you know, I wonder if I hadn't have had that experience in 2006, if things had have played out differently, maybe would I have necessarily come into all of this? Would I have ever started questioning? Would I have ever gone down this particular path? And I've always been able to imagine that Oh, I, I could have gone on to lead a different life and not really gone and pursued this and not really ever bothered too much about this and 9-11 and central banking and that kind of stuff, history of eugenics, whatever. I, I could have imagined a life in which I didn't really grapple with this information, but that is no longer the case. In 2021, I cannot imagine I would simply be reading the newspaper about what is going on and about what is being expected and vaccine passports are now rolling out and we must, everyone must take this emergency youth, use authorized, not approved, yeah. emergency use authorized experimental gene therapy, which, oh, by the way, clinical trials are ongoing. The lab rats are looking at humans waiting. I think I'm going to wait for this until the human trials are done on this one. Um, we must all, and anyone who questions this is a mad, crazy, anti-vaxxer, anti-science charlatan who is now an actual existential threat to humanity uh, because you may be an asymptomatic carrier. All of this nonsense, I cannot imagine that I would not be reading this and at least questioning what I am being told. So I am having de decreasing amounts of sympathy for people who cannot wrap their minds around the, the idea that there could be an agenda at play here and that it would even require more than a few seconds thought as to why any ruling power would want to inflict this on its citizenry. Yeah, of course, this is, this is it. This is ultimate control. When the government or the government appointed bodies or the World Health Organization or anyone else gets to step in and essentially approve you for human society or, oh, sorry, you don't have the green... QR code on your phone. You're not allowed to interact with other human beings. I don't understand what, what possible motivation would a ruler have for wanting to do that? I've never seen that before in history. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Oh my. So as you're talking, I am thinking what I would give to see you debate a professor at a major university, an elite university about any subject, any subject that you, that you, cover would you like to do that ever do you ever fantasize Set it up let's make it happen absolutely i mean i wonder who has the balls for it but um i might be able to find some sucker uh the uh but is that what do you think of academia i mean you had you have somewhat of an academic background uh yeah i went far enough to know no further. <laughs> I, I I remember I, I yeah so I did my MPhil at Anglo uh, in Anglo Irish literature at Trinity College Dublin, and uh, as part of the sort of the end of that program, um, we were getting our our moment with the dean to talk about our future plans, and I I, I just I, he was saying you have any plans for continuing academic work and no. <laughs> and he said 
I understand. <laughs> All right, go on. He was actually trying to dissuade people, essentially saying, this is not what you think it might, you know, it's not going to be like you think. It's going to be bureaucratic, a lot of meetings and nonsense and uh, department politics and other stuff. It's not the fun, pure life of research you might think it's going to be. And I already had that sense. I also knew that I had, I, I was, I, I could have made it as an academic at some middling college in the middle yeah. of nowhere, you know, I, right. I could have made a life out of that, but I did, had no interest in that whatsoever. Plus my intellectual curiosity is wired in a very different way than I think the academic um, community encourages at this point, because the idea to me of spending seven years on a doctoral thesis, knowing everything in the world about this minutiae, tiny little yeah. one aspect of the work of William Faulkner's yeah. short stories or something. <laughs> I am the world expert on that tiny little niche is just not the way I'm wired. No, I want to know a lot about everything that I can get my hands on. So I, I right. knew I would never succeed at that. Um, I had always assumed I was going to be a writer and okay. as an inroad to that, I was going to be an editor at some publishing house or something. That was what I always wanted okay. to pursue. I completely stumbled into this life totally by accident, but at any rate, it keeps me intellectually uh, engaged. Sure does. Yeah. So you say 12 years you've been doing this? 14. 14 years. And during that time, have you been noticed by the establishment? Have you been criticized, attacked, anything? Or have you just been ignored? Very, like, very little. Like most very little. Um, occasionally, not, 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 nothing, even anything to speak of. I, I, really? <laughs> I had some third party correspondence with Noam Chomsky, which means nothing because he responds to everyone. Everybody. But I, th I think someone <laughs> sent him one of my critiques of him and he sent a response to that person. But like, okay. no, I, I, I have, uh, no, I have very little, if any sort of mainstream acknowledgement, but that's okay. actually, I'm remarkably okay with that. Uh, I think it's great to fly just under the radar of sort of mainstream perception yeah. while having an audience of literally millions of people around the world. Oh, that's that's the prime position to be in, to be oh. to be frank, because oh. um, I have always appreciated that when I started in 2007, especially uh, podcasting, like, what is that? That was years before mm -hmm. Rogan even tried it. You know, right. like, no one even knew what that was. And you know, it's just some fringe thing. And that was at the time when people said, where did you get that information? On the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, fast forward to 2021. No one is quite laughing at the idea of getting information from the internet anymore. And that's actually, that's becoming a problem because that means the eye of Sauron is on outlets that have <laughs> independence, genuine independence, yeah. and can say what they yeah. want to say. So no, 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 we can't allow that. So that's, of course, when the censorship hammer starts to come down. And I don't know if you post this to YouTube, but uh, I've I've intimated it several is. times my disapproval of WHO guidelines. So I'm sorry, but your channel is going to be struck if you do try to post yeah. this. No, oh, oh. And so is mine. This is the information era that we're in right now. And I, I've always enjoyed using the enemy information weapon systems to distribute this message for Wait as long as that was possible. But it is <laughs> Wait a second. Do you, are you saying that YouTube will strip my channel? Uh, well, I ha personally have two strikes on my channel. One more and the channel will be deleted. Completely. Oh, I see. A strike. Okay. Oh, my God. Just by having you on, we'll have a strike? Uh, well, I... I if I, if I say anything that goes against WHO guidelines and or local health authorities as determined by YouTube, and of course they'll never tell you what specifically, what did he say? What was the thing? They'll never tell you that much specificity. They'll simply strike the video and give you a warning. Wow, that is horrendous and just Orwellian as anything I've ever seen in my life. This is the most Orwellian moment in my lifetime. Thank, Thank you for saying that because I, become embarrassed about mentioning Orwell in everything that I do every yeah. single time I open my right. mouth, but I cannot help it. Orwell was profoundly important writer and uh, my, my appreciation of him continues to grow as we goose step further and further into the world that he envisioned. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, um, I want to end this problem you've had of the establishment ignoring you. I would like to uh, maybe get you in front of some of them and talk to them. So I will work on that as long as you're willing. Sounds like you are. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. Wouldn't that be fun? Okay. I'm, that's my job, James. Thank you for doing this. Uh, this has been tremendous week. You and I could talk for days and days and days. I'd love to have you back on uh, to cover more because it's just a huge pile of stuff. And, and, and I really felt 
maybe more with you than with any other guest, by the way, uh, just a real intellectual kinship, like and political kinship, uh, maybe more than anyone I've had on the show, honestly, like you were saying stuff even more than in your work. I mean, it really like was right in the slot that I'm in. So it's, it's really fun. And I, but at the same time, you know, so much more than I do about so many of these topics that I just learn like reams of, of information from you. So much appreciation, much thanks, and uh, hope to talk to you soon. Thank you for having me on. And uh, for people who are interested, just check out corporatereport.com. All of my work is available for free. So please use it as a resource and look at the documents. I cite documents and I, I share them. That's what it's about. Absolutely. Corporate report. It's amazing. Okay, man. Thank you. We'll talk thank soon. You. Okay. Take care. Bye. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To join the new Renegade University, go to renegadeuniversity.com. To join the new Unregistered Underground, the supporting listeners group for the podcast, go to unregisteredunderground.com. Thanks for listening.